Welcome to the Best of MBS podcast, a collection of the best interviews hosted by Michael Bungay Stanier, best-selling author of The Coaching Habit and How to Begin. Today's interview is from the We Will Get Through This podcast. Here's your host, MBS. So Rick Lay, the man I'm about to introduce you to, was almost responsible for a career choice of mine that would have been probably disastrous and certainly wouldn't have ended up me being the person I am today in the country I am today. Here's how it happened. Rick and I went to high school together. And unlike me, Rick had given some thought to his future beyond the high school. And so when we hit our final year, and I was like, wait, it's our final year? What? What?" (laughs) Because I was completely unprepared. Rick had a plan. Rick was like, you know what? I'm heading up to Sydney. I'm going to get myself a scholarship and I'm going to join the Navy. And, you know, the scholarship was worth something. I mean, it was like, I think 400 bucks. I was like, 400 bucks? <laughs> Count me in. I'm not going to join the Navy because I'm not that good on boats, but Air Force. I'm going to go up and I'm going to join the Air Force. So Rick heads up and does his thing and wins his scholarship and begins a career in the Navy. And I'll talk about that in a second. I head up and just have a series of unmitigated disasters, including trying to lie my way through the medical test, which then meant I failed the medical test, which stopped me joining Australia's military and headed me off in a completely different direction, which probably the Australian military, amongst others, are grateful for. But anyway, Rick, who was a good friend of mine at high school, started a career in the Navy, and even though, as he said, he spent years, 21 years, thinking about getting out, stayed in after cool job after cool job kept him interested. During his career, he served on the staff of the Chief of the Australia's Navy on multiple ships, was deployed on the ground on operations to Cambodia, Timor, Leste, and Iraq. And as a junior officer, he was awarded the Queen's Gold Medal, and later in his career, the Conspicuous Service Cross. Since leaving the military, Rick has worked as a consultant and designs and delivers a range of leadership programs for Australia's top business schools, and also has become a neuro nerd completing an executive master's in neuroscience and leadership. Rick Lay, (laughs) how are you? I'm well, thanks, Michael. How about you? I am doing just fine. Yeah, that I, who knows what would have happened if I'd ended up in the Australian Navy. (laughs) I'm just thinking something terrible. Well, I'm pretty sure that you've gilded a few lilies there in the introduction and, um, (laughs) um, and yeah, like particularly one about Rick having a plan. Um, (laughs) My recollection of some of those same years is that my father took me off to a careers night, um, right. some very cold and windswept TAFE, and we looked at, you know, the lawyer stand, we looked at the doctor stand, we looked at the teacher stand and all that sort of stuff, and then we ended at the military stand, and um, I was very taken by all these photos and videos of people doing exciting things. My father was very taken of, uh, by the fact that um, if if a young child joined the um, the defence academy, they got a free university education. <laughs> that's right. That was, that was that was another match made in heaven. <laughs> so I think that's why I ended up on the train going to Sydney for the scholarship interview, Michael. Well, it feels like it served you well, knowing that you have a flourishing career there. Ending up, of course, at the same rank as James Bond as commander, which is just cool right there and then. Um, but it's also it set you up for a career thinking about and championing leadership. But I'm curious to know what what was it about neuroscience that kind of pulled you down that path? Yeah, like that's a great question, and it, and, and it is one that I have actually pondered for you know, like for a fair while. I, I think about it myself, and I get asked that by others. And I think the I think the short answer is. Um, as I, uh, or, um, I'd finished my military career and I was beginning to work, um, uh, down at Melbourne business school and I was putting together these theoretical programs. And as I was putting together these theoretical programs, I was thinking I'd, I'd be doing some reading about stuff and think, really, is that what the theory is? That, yeah, that doesn't seem to make sense compared to my experience or right. just as, often, oh, wow. So that's when, uh, that's why when I did that, it didn't work. Right. <laughs> because, okay, um, and so, so I, I've actually become quite interested in the theory and the practice of leadership and strategy and other sorts of things. And the, and the, um, kind of the newest bits of research that were beginning to emerge there in the, you know, the early 2000s uh, was around uh, neuroscience and yeah. leadership. And I got to the point where 
I wanted more than the airport bookstore version. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I kind of consumed all the, uh, you know, like all the, all the general books about, you know, making your brain better and, you know, brain hacks and all that sort of stuff. And yep. there was something, something really useful in that um, it, it, as you begin your exploration. But um, for me, something a little bit unsatisfying. So, so I felt I wanted more. What, what has surprised you most as you've become deeper immersed in the actual world of neuroscience and are kind of understanding it at that more academic, more kind of grounded in the actual research level? And you bring to it your experience of leadership both in the field and you know, testing it against other theories that you know about. Is there anything that's kind of really jolted you and gone, oh, I wasn't expecting that? Perhaps dozens of things. Um, yeah. and, 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 and first I'd caveat this by sort of saying Rick Lay is not a neuroscientist. Um, so, so, you know, the, you know, the neuroscientists that are actually doing the, you know, the pure research or uh, particularly those working in the, in, the, in the field of social cognitive neuroscience, like, like they are the real brains, they are the real sort of stars of this. Um, I am a mere consumer of their research, uh, Gallup, Gallup by comparison. Yeah. And I think, that, I think kind of the, the two things that have really struck me um, have been one about, uh, um, you know, how, uh, how our brain is actually really kind of finely engineered over, you know, hundreds of thousands, perhaps longer, oh, sorry, uh, perhaps more years of, of evolution yeah. uh, to be socially connected. Um, right. So, you know, like, why would that be so? Um, you know, there must have been an evolutionary reason for that. And the, the other one, and, and, and I'm sure this is something that, um, that, that you're also very interested in too is, you know, what's actually going on in our brain when we have those seemingly fantastic ideas. So at that <laughs> very moment of insight, you know, and how do we, how do we get more of that? So, I love that. so those are perhaps the two things that are, you know, like of most interest to me. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that. I remember my first access to brain science wasn't even brain science, but it was in the, in the mid nineties and in that time, I was working in the world of creativity and innovation. And it was kind of explained to me a little bit about how the unconscious mind, you know, when you're in that dreaming state, how the unconscious mind opens up and makes a connection to your conscious mind. And I was like, that's amazing. And that probably isn't really interesting metaphor for what happens. It's probably not what happens. Um, and it'd be very interesting to dig into that whole, how does curiosity, how does the brain use curiosity to create those unusual unexpected combinations of things that turn into the ideas that we have and we run with yeah yeah like i think that's i think that's a super interesting comment michael i mean that um that i i I think when i'm at my best i work at that kind of interface between you know what the super smart scientists are saying and doing um and how do we actually translate that for right uh like those of us who are not the super smart scientists. And so, so a question I love to ask people on strategy programs or leadership programs is uh, where are they and what are they doing when they do their best thinking? Yeah. So where are they and what are they doing when they do their best thinking? And, and I actually get them to pause because if they answer it immediately, um, you know, what we we'll <laughs> often get is, you know, oh, well, for instance, I had a good idea once seven years ago um, but but, it, but if, if people think about it, mm-hmm. almost invariably, no one is sitting in the office right. at their desk, and I'm yet to hear a person saying uh, it's actually answering an email or I'm working <laughs> on my computer. Right. Uh, invariably, the answers are it, I'm walking the dog in the morning, or it's uh, last thing at night, or it's while I'm sitting in front of television. I'm actually not watching television, but all of a sudden, these ideas begin to pop into my mind. It's while I'm exercising. It's in the shower. It's yeah. over a glass of wine, uh, and, and like what I found, I've got no research to back this up, but uh, except that you know, I've asked this question to you know, you know thousands of people, is that most of us actually do our best thinking by ourselves, and for those few of us that do our best thinking with other people, it's with a really small group. It might be just two or three, you know, really trusted colleagues where we feel that we can kind of bounce the ideas off, and so, so I think that's 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 really interesting when we match that back to what's actually going on in the brain. There needs to be something that allows our brain to be like real deep relaxed so it's kind of almost working mm-hmm. at another level you know unseen unknown to us yep. and then um and, and then coming back to your metaphor all of a sudden it seems like we, we this idea is just you know magically appeared in our mind but actually it's probably been you know uh, processed for 
hours, days, maybe even weeks. Yeah. You know, um, there's a book whose title I can't remember by a man whose name I can't remember. So, well, we, so we can talk about Mary and the Brain later if you like. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but uh, he is he he gets and talk interviewed by Tim Ferriss fairly regularly because he is a master at the discipline of practice and he was a chess prodigy and um, then at a certain point gave that up and became a um, world champion uh, martial artist and he studies the art of peak performance and that discipline and one of the the disciplines he has is as his final act of the evening, he poses his brain a question, something that he wants an answer to. And it can either be a very specific tactical thing or it can be a kind of bigger, more philosophically grounded question. And then he goes to sleep. And then when he wakes up, he journals on it immediately. That's his very first act. And it's bringing that that feeling that you and I have got, which is there's something interesting when you get a little distracted and you come at the problem sideways. And it's percolating in a way that you're not even quite sure about and going, you know what, you can actually make this a discipline and a regular part of the way that you run and you live your life. And I'm like, that's a great idea. I should get around to doing that one day. I haven't quite done it yet. Well, I've done it a few times, but I haven't done it systematically yet, but it does feel it's tapping into some of the insights you've got there. Yeah, that, yeah that's fantastic. There's, um, there's a couple of researchers in Australia. I can only remember one off the top of my head, and that's a lady called Corinne Cantor. Mm -hmm. um, so she and her colleague did some work. Oh, this is maybe maybe seven years or so ago, um, and, uh, and and the work culminated in a concept that they called Supermind. Um, and so what they try and do is they actually try and help individuals to discover what that activity is that will actually get the person's brains into into this kind of more creative sort of state. So, so uh, journaling might work for some. Um, I know yeah. what works for me is is it's um, it's it's exercise. Um, yeah. And in the old days, it used to be quite intense exercise. These days, I've got a little bit older. It's it's actually not the exercise itself. It's kind of the walk at the end of the exercise. Oh, but, cool. Um, but just helping people find that activity. So it, it, um, for some people, it can be drawing. For some others, it's just it's physically doing something with your body. Um, yep. And there's the, the really interesting experiment. I, I, I think I think I get this right. Um, where they actually got people to mimic um, mimic being in the shower. It was a bit hard in the in the kind <laughs> of um, in, right in, in the lab. lab. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like in the lab to have yeah, somebody just in the, in, the, in the corner throwing a bucket of water over them they like no just, yeah. just imagine you're in the shower it's awesome because it because there seems to be something about the repetitive sort of physical yeah. actions that kind of um quiet down you know a part of the brain while allowing you know, mm -hmm. like another bit of the brain sort of come up so uh, special shout out to corinne Cantor and her um uh, yeah, like I've done, I've done the brain memory thing as well. And to, to <laughs> perfect, we're the yes. perfect people to guide people through this. You know that thing yeah, by the no, person no, who no. did the other thing. Yeah, it's about yeah. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> I have no idea. Who are you? <laughs> have we met? Um, you can edit this later, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, can, you can put all these names back in, and the both of us will right. So way more intelligent. So good. Yeah. So Rick. That's hinting at what we can get to when we're doing our best work and we, we're finding ourselves in a situation which allows us to hit that peak, whatever that might be for us. But what happens in times of stress is somehow the opposite. We kind of get shut down we hunker down. The little amygdala gets a bit kind of crazy. How do you, what, how do you, how do you help me manage that? Because, you know, in a perfect world where I'm like carefree and happy and not stressed, I can often find my way to the best of myself. But I find it hard when I'm kind of spiraling. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think that's that's kind of the million dollar question or perhaps the trillion dollar question at right. the moment, isn't it, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, and, and, and we kind of know this intuitively. We know that when we're under stress and under immense pressure, we don't do our best work. So, so like we know that. Yeah. But the... Um, what the neuroscientists have really helped us to understand around this is um, under under stress and pressure, the limbic regions of the brain. So you mentioned one part of it, the amygdala. Yeah. 
uh, but the whole limbic region does become more active. And, and what this means is, you know, that uh, a light at its extreme, it could be sending off some signals to pump some adrenaline into our body, you know, the fight, flight, freeze response. Yep. It probably is sending some signals to actually put out some more cortisol into our body. Um, but the, the challenge for us is it actually um, can... Uh, limit the ability of for us to think rationally and logically the parts mm. of our, you know the you know if you like the executive function of our brain in particular the you know the prefrontal cortex and some other areas so like we're actually not able to calculate or reason our way through um at um uh, under extremes and nor are we able to actually kind of free our brains up to actually do this you know if you like this more creative this more insight sort of process and so 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 to me um the uh, you know, like the acronym that, um, that that David Rock and his neuro leadership team sort of came up with many many years ago. So the acronym of SCARF, so mm-hmm. S C A R F, so status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, yep. is really useful to keep in mind at the moment. So I think about what's going on in the world, right? So the situation that we all face at the moment is that this is a global pandemic. Yeah. Um, so, so what does that mean? Well, it means that lots of people are feeling overwhelmed. Well, and you don't need to be a CEO to be feeling overwhelmed. You don't need to be a chief medical officer to be feeling overwhelmed. You might just be a regular, you know, mum or dad or school teacher or healthcare worker, right. and you're getting multiple different information sources coming at you. You're worried about your health. You're worried about the health of your family. You're worried about you know, the well-being and the health of the people that you work with. And you're probably worried about your job. Like, what, right. what does this mean? And so that's, that's really likely to be inducing um, some, some moments of stress. And so a couple of particular things about it is, like, well, we've lost our sense of certainty. So who can right. tell us, you know, how long we're going to be in our periods of, you know, social isolation? Is right, it exactly. Weeks? that we're hearing from some sources is it months is yeah. it, is it longer when we come out the other side what does that mean you know like will will those uh, elderly relatives that we um that we have living in other cities or in other countries will they still be alive right um like, like will we have jobs you know when's the economy going to recover so we actually have no certainty about those sort of things and you know, like my guess um is your brain like mine like everyone else's you know we're, we're kind of going to bed at night Mm -hmm. And we're pondering all those sort of things. And so if we kind of get into those sort of circular spirals, we're we're probably not going to be doing our um, our best work. And there's, and there's another bit that I'll, that, that I'll come back to shortly that I think is just as important. And I think it's a really practical, useful thing that we can all do that helps others, but it also helps to get our brain into a better state. Part of, part of what this situation has made more apparent to me is my lack of control over anything <laughs> because you know the pandemic at the moment but anytime that things go south um that the, you just go look i don't have i don't have any control over what's going on and i have barely any influence over what's going on and that sense of helplessness um is part of what what keeps you stuck what keeps me stuck at least um how how do I is there a way of trying to regain a sense of some sort of control in a time like this? Yeah, yeah, like I think there is, Michael. So um, you know, again, coming back to that, you know, scarf um, yeah. acronym, um, this sense of helplessness would directly relate to that that element of that around autonomy. So mm-hmm. it is very easy to feel that we actually have lost control, and. And, and what I'm not saying is that we do have control over everything. But you know what? We didn't have control over everything. <laughs> right. It's just, but, it's, just made what's, it's just made the reality more apparent. <laughs> the fantasy yeah. has been stripped away. Yeah. And, and, and like, you know, not from a, yeah, like from a humorous perspective, um, I was thinking the other day, I, like I was connected up with some other ex-military colleagues and we we're kind of laughing because we said, you know, it, you know, our military background has prepared us really well for this lack of control because, you know, um, like for me in, in particular, I spent 21 years being told what to do. Right. I spent 21 years having, you know, instructions given to me that were constantly changing. Right. Um, I, I spent lots of time having to carry a mask around with me for like no apparent reason. <laughs> I, right. you know, I had my weekend plans, you know, turned on their head you know frequently yeah and and of, of course most seriously of all for an australian you know the um the best bars are now off limits as well so <laughs> it's you know, a all, disaster all, like, <laughs> yeah, all, all, yeah i mean they're they're, they're kind of light-hearted examples about you know what what the control that's been taken away from us but what do we have control over and so yeah so like a, a thing that i think about is um 
uh, like in the military, we were taught to, you know, quickly try and understand what was going on, at least at least the picture, the part of the picture that you could see and observe. And so, you know, so we might describe that as a situation. We were talking about the, that before. Look, it's a global yeah. pandemic. People are feeling overwhelmed. You know, they're worried about themselves, their family and their business. So what's the mission we can give ourselves in that? Right? So neither you or I can actually do anything to, to change that at a global level, but we sure as hell can do lots of stuff um, at our, at our local level. And so right. this to me is always a nice metaphor around leadership is, you know, we can't change the world, but we can influence the people that we have direct contact with. And so, right. so the, the mission that I've set myself is um, I want my family to be safe. I mm-hmm. want to be safe and healthy. I want the people that I work with to be safe and healthy. And second, um, I actually want my business to survive. Right. So if I kind of prioritize it like that, um, n- now I've got some sense of control because that, that will guide my actions every day. If, if first and foremost is the you know, safety and health of you know, the people close to me, you know, whether it's my family and the people I work with, well, that's good. My second, in, uh, you know, like my second priority is actually you know, like the, the yeah. safety and health of the business. D- d- does that make some sense? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Do you did your training in the military teach you how to best read a situation or or read it with a little more subtlety and reality than other people otherwise might? I mean, when I did my law degree, one of the things that I remember I don't remember nothing from my law degree, but <laughs> other than how terrible people are at being eyewitnesses and how there's this fantasy that if you have an eyewitness, they can tell you what happened. And so often they're, they just entirely wrong. And what I can imagine is that it is in a time of stress in particular, it's actually hard for you to, to read the situation because of everything you've already talked about, about what's going on in the brain. What, yeah. what do you deploy to get a better reading of what's really going on? So, so I think um, I'll, I'll start with the general point that lots of military training uh, is designed to actually put you in stressful um, situations mm-hmm. um, and, and actually help you to kind of get beyond survival mode into uh, the military would hate this term or, or, or at least they would have hated the term you know, like when I was in it into a kind of more of a thriving mode. So right. um, there's lots of, you know, what the old experimental psychologists would sort of say conditioned behavior. So if you're doing battle drills, you want them to be as re- realistic as possible. The whole idea of that is, uh, is when something, something goes badly wrong and, and people are under real stress in the sense that, you know, um, mm-hmm. uh, in a few short moments, you and your colleagues could, could lose your lives. We actually want people to be able to continue to work um, right. in that environment. Now, now, there's not many right. people that need to be trained for that, you know, paramedics, emergency services, all that sort right. of stuff. Um, and, and, and probably the, probably the special forces lawyers, you know, you know, like such as yourself. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, I've heard and, the saying, you don't rise to the, you don't rise to the occasion. You sink to the level of your training and you're kind of, yeah. it's an indication of that. Yeah, and, 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 and the really interesting thing is um, as realistic as they can make that training, um, it still doesn't work for everyone. So we still actually might find that when it does actually come out in a real operation, um, that those, those people that just absolutely aced all the training, they were the real standout soldiers or sailors or airmen, when it really comes down to it, when the brain can actually flick the switch and say, you know what, um, this isn't Kansas anymore. This is actually yeah. really real. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's hard for them. And then there's some others that actually just really come into their own. Not only can they just continue to operate, but they actually see things clearer. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, so, so, so there's another branch of research, you know, that, that kind of goes into that state of flow and things like that. And there yep. seems to be some people that actually, you know, uh, become super operators in the yeah, like in those sort of senses. So, so, so that's a long answer. Yeah. yeah like interesting. But yeah, but I think, um, I think, I th- think I wasn't taught a whole lot in the military in terms of formally about how to read and judge a circumstance. Right. But I'll tell you what, I certainly learned a lot in the military about how to read and judge circumstances because I think that does come with experience and, you know, and practice. One of the things that I, you know, having lived in this field of leadership and neuroscience a little bit for some years, I go, okay, you know, there's the classic, is it Covey, the circle of control, circle of influence, and then circle of neither of control nor influence. And when it comes down to it, you go, what can you can control? You control 
your mindset, you can control your reaction to, to the situation. You can't control what's around you, but you can control that. How, what can you tell us about how mindset works and how we might deploy that or think about that in a time of anxiety or stress? Yeah. So, so for me, um, there's kind of three particular mindsets that I've been playing around with, I don't know, for the last, you know, 25 years or so. So Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I, I didn't have these labels for them when I, when I first needed them. It was just kind of me being nicely self-reflective. The first time I was kind of really under some serious operational pressure, and that was when I was deployed uh, to Cambodia with the United Nations Peacekeeping Force back in the early 1990s. So, you know, uh, a horrible, horrible experience for us, but infinitely worse for, uh, yes. for the poor Cambodian people on the ground. So, you know, this was the after the Paris Peace Accords, the UN deployed um, into Cambodia uh, after it had been decimated by Pol Pot. So estimates vary, but, you know, from one to three million of the people either executed or died of starvation under, mm. the, under the time of Pol Pot. And so every single person that I met um, had, um, you know, like an immediate relative, so a father, a child, um, a, a husband, mm-hmm. a wife or something like that that, that, that had died. So... It was terrible. And so I, I need, for me, I needed to find a way that actually worked for me. And so um, the, the, the three kind of mindset labels I've come up with or that, um, that I began to think about back then, but I used when I was deployed in Iraq. Um, and interestingly, I use kind of um, you know, like these days, um, you know, like particularly as we're addressing this. And um, you know, like also when I'm doing the, those kind of strange ultra endurance events that I seem to have fallen into as well. <laughs> yeah. so, the, the, so the three mindsets are, you know, the first one is the sensei. Um, the second one is the scientist, um, and the third one, I used to call it socialist, but you know that's got a whole bunch of other connotations. That people <laughs> right. so much. So Pinky, like, commie, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, I've modified that to the yellow, you know, like the socialising, and I think these mindsets are really, really useful because, as you say, Michael, we don't have control over other stuff, but we do have control over actually what's going on in our brain. Other mm-hmm. people and events influence it, but we actually have that complete control over it. Um, and, and uh, like another framework I've found really, really useful for the current crisis is um, Dave Snowden's uh, Kinefin framework. So we're, you know, I think at the very least we're dealing with a complex system, arguably yep. dealing with a chaotic system. And so um, like Dave Snowden says, you know, there's, there's stuff we can still do as leaders even when it's chaos. Right. Um, and that, that's around, you know, um, um, you know, taking some action uh, and probing and sensing. And so... Um, I'm, I'm happy to go into those three different mindsets and what they mean to me if, if you think that will be yeah, useful. I'd love to hear that. Okay, so um, let's, let's start then with the scientist. So, uh, sorry, let, let me start with the sensei. The sensei is much better for me to start with. Okay. Um, so the, so the, look, what, what image does that conjure in, uh, uh, conjure in people's mind? You know, the, you know, the yeah. sitting cross-legged, you know, you know, the sound of one hand clapping or whatever it happens to be. To me, the image it conjures in my mind is, you know, someone actually being in the moment. Right. You've got all this information kind of coming, coming past us at a, a rate of knots. So I'm sure it's the same for you in Canada as it is for us in Australia at the moment. You yeah. can watch news 24 hours a day um, and you would be getting multiple different sort of points of view and perspectives, mm-hmm. uh, often contradictory. Yep. So what the sensei is able to do, or what the sensei mindset is able to do is actually just, you know, sort of think, hmm, yeah, isn't that interesting? But right. not latch not latch on to any of those as you right. know, one thing that we have to do. So it's, it's not, not letting you get overwhelmed by the input, but it, it is actually kind of beginning to think and reflect on actually what might be important here. I think the other superpower of the sensei mindset is other people look at you and sort of say, well, that person's calm. They're in control. Right. Things, things must be okay. <laughs> right. And, no, I, and what I they agree. don't realize is, yeah, yeah. I mean, people don't respond to a strong signal, and one of if you know you're talking about uh, before, how do you how do you influence the people around you, your family, the people you work with, the people you connect with, and if you can be a signal of calm, people will respond to that, and and not only pick up on that, but kind of with mirror neurons, be kind of going, I'm starting to be calm myself just by the nature of your calmness. Yeah. I think so, and, and and you know that that um, 
if if that's the only signal that we can send, and even if it's only within our own household, that's that's not a bad thing. So, like perhaps one way for people to kind of do more of the sense though is, you know, if if you are consuming all this news constantly, turn it off. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's really unlikely things are going to change in the next hour. Yeah, <laughs> and and try not to get overwhelmed by the data. You know, like be that model of calm. Um, yeah, the, I love that. The, what I'm taking away from that, Rick, is um, detached curiosity. You know, curious yeah. to, to let the stuff go by, but not holding on to anything too tightly. Yeah, and and in fact, the the curiosity bit is a perfect connection to the to the second mindset where, uh, that I describe as as being the scientist. So, if the sensei was in the moment, not getting overwhelmed by all the mm-hmm. data, the scientist is actually really looking at the data. Right, it's looking at it logically, it's pulling it apart, but it's it's not trying to find every single piece of the puzzle. Um, I can't remember which particular Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so a story uh, when he was talking about the difference between puzzles and mysteries. Oh, interesting. But this to me, yeah, this to me is a, you know, if, if we're in a chaotic system or a complex system at least is this is not a puzzle to be solved. This is a mystery to be solved because uh-huh. re- really we, we don't know what the answer will be. You know, we were talking before about, you know, um, uh, our loss of autonomy and our loss of certainty. Yes. We, we actually, yeah, like we actually don't know how long we're going to be in lockdown and what the world's going right. to look like. Yeah, you're like at the other end. So, so, so the scientist mindset is super useful, um, yeah, like for this because rather than looking for every single piece of the puzzle, it's looking for the patterns. Right. And um, like the scientists that 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 I know and you know like have loved interacting with, you know, they they can look at you know a tiny you know finite piece of the brain. Um, and there's so much information just about that. I mean, we're learning more about the brain, you know, than, than we ever have before. Mm-hmm. And I think another cool thing about uh, being a neuro, uh, self-described neuro nerd is that stuff that I was, you know, discovering 10 years ago is no longer true. Right. There's, there's better measurement systems or there's, be, or there's better research that's overturned it. So the scientist, um, the scientist mindset, and this is actually looking at the data, but it's looking for patterns to, to kind of see to, to see what that might mean. And I think the other really important thing about being curious as the scientist is let's put together a couple of experiments, right? Because when we're putting together a couple of experiments, we begin to get some sense of control over what's going on because we're actually doing some stuff. Right. So, for instance, um, I. Um, I became ill last week, probably just, you know, a cold and flu and all that sort of stuff. But I was, I, I was really quite sick on the, you know, like on the Wednesday night. Um, I'm trying to get, take all this advice that, that we're talking about myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, like I'm, I, I've been, I've been locked upstairs. Um, yeah. You know, like in our house, like, you know, like trying to do the right thing by my wife and daughter. Um, and a thing I love to do is get outside and run, but, but I actually don't want to be running around the you know, like the neighbourhood and through the parks just in case that I, I am infectious and I'm going to catch um, yeah. someone else. So a little experiment I conducted yesterday, I went back to my old military days when I used to go running on a warship and, and like running on ships in the Australian Navy, they're not great big aircraft carriers like, like the Americans have. They're often small frigates and I used to um, be able to run 10 kilometres around a flight deck, you know, a helicopter flight deck at, at the, at the back of a ship i remember one captain sort of watching me doing that because i'd kind of come in and out of the flight deck camera you know, right. every seconds and he says like don't you get bored and i said no the view, the view's constantly changing <laughs> <laughs> so, so 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 coming back to the science science sort of thing it's you know it's looking for the patterns but it's yeah. actually let's design an experiment like like does that work so i was running around our backyard yesterday and uh, our next door neighbor's daughter was jumping up and down on the trampoline so my view was constantly changing too i could nice. see her every every half a second <laughs> that's fantastic what about should we talk third, about the yeah, third mindset sorry. yeah so i actually think the third mindset is probably the most practical and useful bit of advice i can give to everyone oh the, great you know, like in the current environment and so that's why i've left it um you know, like um to last um so my third mindset is, yeah, like, is the socializer. So we were talking before about the SCARF model and we spoke yeah. about, you know, certainty and autonomy. But I think even more important is this sense that the brain craves social connection. So right. this is where you started the conversation with, which is yeah. like, what's that about? We're, we're, we've been around for a quarter of a million years <laughs> and we've yeah. built this up. What's that, what's that telling us? Yeah. So, so, um, 
I got super interested in this um, Matt Lieberman, who's uh, you know I think just a fantastic social cognitive neuroscientist, wrote a book called Social, um, actually putting forward his social brain hypothesis. hypothesis. Um, and and Matt's partner Naomi Eisenberger um, has also done a whole bunch of work on this. You know, so uh, Naomi's perhaps most famous for um, you know, some of her um, some of her work on. Uh, 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 social pain uh, activating the same networks in our brain as physical pain. Oh, so, yes. so the whole thing about social, uh, the social brain hypothesis, the whole thing about our brain, our brain's craving a social connection is this is what we also need to do. Our third mindset is to be the socializer. So to be a connector. So if the sensei is all about, you know, being in the moment, the scientist is all about being curious. The socializer is all about uh, being a connector. Um, and so, so a thing for me is we should all be reaching out as much as we can to others uh, and, and be willing to help. And so what does this reaching out mean? It's not, to me, it's not just a random email. Hey, haven't spoken for 17 years. Um, <laughs> just, just checking in and making sure you know, like you're okay. Yeah. I mean, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. But, but, but actually being a connector is actually really showing empathy. Mm. Um, and what that means, I think, in the current circumstance is actually adding the empathy to the conversation. So spending a lot more time listening than talking, not being that social kind of drain on the conversation. And what I mean by that is, hey, let's talk about some more really scary statistics or you know, right. let's, let's, let's kind of amp up the worry that the other person's got, but actually, right. actually listening and showing you know, like empathy for them. Right. Um, Being a source and, of light, not shade. Yeah, and and the only caveat I put around that, Michael, is um, it's highly likely that this is going to go for months, not weeks. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if if you are that person that's always showing empathy to others, then you're at risk now because you know um, this might become overwhelming for you. So right. if you're the one that actually needs that empathic listener on the you know, like on the other end, then it's perfectly okay to also kind of ask for help. And the yes. and the and the kind of the little uh, I wouldn't call it a mindset, but um, but but a lesson I need to continue to learn. Um, you know, like these days, much more with these these kind of weird ultra endurance events that I do, is that for me the challenge when the pressure really comes on is I tend to go inside myself. Mm -hmm. So when I'm physically very tired or it's really hurting a lot or I just want to give in, I tend to withdraw into myself. And you know, and and, and I I can kind of see it. You know, I, instead of like focusing in a couple of, you know a couple of hundred meters ahead, I'm kind of only looking you know ten meters in front of my feet. And right. I, you know, I've 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 lost the sense of nature around me. Uh, and so instead of going within, actually reach out to others. And you know, like a, a, a little trick I've used on those events is just, you know, when I come up to the next runner or, or they're passing me, I just start a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I might just go for, you know, 30 seconds or a minute or so. But all of a sudden, I, I feel so much better. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's just, it's, it's always that reaching out. So if I can encourage everyone to kind of, you know, like reach out and be the socializer, um, yep. I think that's a very powerful uh, way of actually. That giving us a sense of certainty and control. There are some things that we can do to get through this. What I love about the, uh, the guidance here, Rick, is um, the, the nuance in that piece around, look, you don't want to be the person who is a, a constant source of, you know, kind of ramping up the worry and the anxiety in the group. Um, and there's a place for being the calm and the light and also there's a place where you need self-care or, or not just self-care, but other care as well. It's like you need to find your empathetic listener as well. So you're not bearing the burden of my job is to make everybody else feel better and I get burnt out by that. So you're, it's like, how do you, it's a classic Adam Grant piece. It's like, make sure that you give, but make sure that you take in the right way as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like spot on Michael. And yeah, uh, uh, yeah like I'm also reminded, um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of military, uh, kind of, you know, um, uh, axioms or, you know, expressions and sayings and all that sort of stuff. But I think, I, th I think another thing that I'm really keeping at the front of my mind at the moment is that people at the front line for this crisis, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. There might be some military people at the front line, but, but mostly they are nurses, they're doctors, yeah. they're the 
they're the ward attendants, they're the cleaners at the hospital. They're also the, the scientists, you know, the people working in the, in the laboratories trying to come up with better tests and obviously mm-hmm. working on the cures. But they're also the people doing that mundane stuff where they're just processing blood samples that you're yep. trying to turn it around as quickly as they can. They're also the people in the not-for-profits, the ones that are you know, running right. the food bank or the people working at, in, the, in the really high-risk areas, which are aged care facilities. I mean, mm-hmm. none of us could have predicted this like just even if, even even you know like a few weeks, let alone a few months or so ago. And so a big shout out to them. And so mm-hmm. in particular, if a- any of your listeners kind of know people working in those fields, they're the ones that as a priority, we should actually try and connect with and actually check in with them from an empathetic uh, standpoint because I think that can have some real fantastic effects for all of us. I love them. Rick, I love this conversation. Thank you. It's a regret of mine that you live in Australia. I live in Canada and uh, we, we're in touch more than once every 17 years by email, but we're not in touch as much as I would like to be. And these conversations just remind me what a pleasure it is to talk to you. So thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me on the call, Michael. It's um, yeah, like it's great to connect up with you. And so, please, you look after all of those people that are yeah, that are that are that are close to you as well. And if if you need anything done for your Australian based brethren, um, thank you. I'm willing to help as well. Thank you, and Rick. For people who want to find out more about you and your work, is there somewhere you can direct them? No, there's nowhere I can direct them because they don't need to find out any, anything more about me. What they need to do is actually go out and connect with get yellow with others. Unless they've been connected with me before, um, please Love focus it. on yeah, please focus on everyone else at the moment. That's fantastic, Rick. You're awesome. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this best of MBS interview. Want more great content? Head to mbs.works. There you'll find MBS's new podcast, Two Pages. You can learn about his best-selling books, and you can join the newsletter. That's mbs.works.